everyone, thanks for coming to my talk. So I think everyone here just so excited about what machine learning can do, right? So today and also like in the future. So uh, in terms of my research group, the thing that we are curious about is really by looking at the process of building machine learning applications for everyone in our society. So one challenge that we are kind of really kind of like excited about and also worry about is actually the observation that building machine learning and the AI models today can be ridiculously actually expensive, right? So if you look at where the cost comes in, they actually come from so many different directions. For some of those models, they simply need a lot of computation and a lot of storage, right? If you look at those big language models, it's not uh, uncommon for them to require thousands of petaflop days. If you look at those like state-of-the-art recommendation models, it's very easy for them to occupy 10 terabyte or 100 terabyte of storage. They simply need a lot of compute and storage. And on the other hand, the cost of ownership for infrastructure is actually not that cheap. Right? If you combine these two together, it's actually not uncommon for you to actually spend like a couple million dollars to train those big language models and also spend tens of thousands of dollars to just to hold those big recommendation models in your memory. But this is just about building a single model. When you talk about developing a single machine learning model, it's actually getting more and more expensive. So there's a cost for development, right? Hiring someone is very expensive to build your application. And also the cost of data is also non-trivial, right? So in some of our application, it could be easily spend like a couple of dollars to just annotate something and also clean something. And also people start to care about things beyond the accuracy and the quality, right? When it comes to fairness and robustness, right? So which are very important for application, there's also the cost to be compliant to the regulation. And not to say there's operational cost when, when you deploy your machine like models to practice. How can we monitor it? How can we test it? How can we type and how can we scale? So the goal of my research group is really by looking at this landscape and try to understand how can we bring down all those costs by at least 10 times. So our dream is to turn what is costing you one hour to train down to a couple of minutes and turn whatever you are doing, like require 10 labels, down to one label. So the key hypothesis of our group is that once we decrease this cost by one order of magnitude, it's probably going to change how people are building, developing, testing those models today. And hopefully that can make many very hard social economical discussions much easier to have. But this is a super hard problem because if you look at this landscape, we kind of need to tackle all these dimensions at the same time. Right? Because often it requires you to co-design the algorithm and also the system side. In terms of my research group, we actually focus on these two different questions. So the first question that we're looking at is by really looking at every single bit that you need to communicate through the network, every single floating point operations that you have to run, every single addition barriers that you are enforcing, such that machine are waiting for each other, every single data movement and shuffling you are conducting, every piece of data that you must hold in memory, and every fast connection you are building between those devices to make your infrastructure so expensive. We look at the, all those components that actually making the machine training process so expensive and really try to ask, are they really necessary? If they are necessary, how can we uh, kind of like design a new algorithm to accommodate it? If they are not necessary, how can we get rid of them? So the second thing that we have been looking at is by looking at the process of building those applications. So how can we improve the quality of a machine learning model? How can we continue testing the quality of a machine learning model? How can we adapt a model to different scenarios as systematic and data efficient as possible? So over the years, what we realized is you can actually make progress on both fronts. On the system side, by just co-designing this algorithm, the data ecosystem, the hardware, you can actually get a lot of performance. So there's a whole bunch of open source products that we contribute to. You can actually play with the different ways for you to scale up your machine learning training. And also on the development side, so what we kind of realize is that if you give the user a principled systematic guideline through this end-to-end -end process of building machine learning applications, if you direct the attention of the user to the right direction, and often there are a lot of savings that you can actually enable. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about one very specific component. It's actually about how to draw and analyze data quality and machine learning quality, which is actually very related to this current trend of data-centric AI. So what motivates our study? 
if you look at the whole people are building machine learning application today, it has never been easier. So most of the cloud service providers all have their AutoML platform, right? So, I mean, we can just take a random one. If you go to Google, right, you can just drag and drop your data side, and then the system is going to produce a model for you. So it has never been easier for you to get a machine learning model from some cloud service providers. But what's next? What if this model is not good enough? And what is the reason that this model is not good enough? And if you need to fix something in the model or in the data, what is the most important piece that we should focus on? So if you ask these questions, it becomes kind of challenging because building machine learning applications in real world never look like this textbook picture that you have. Your training side on the left hand side, you pipe that into a training process, you get a model, you measure the quality, and you have some utility of your model. Maybe about accuracy, maybe it's fairness, but it's never as simple as that. In practice, it's often the case that you have a whole bunch of problems in your data. You could have a missing value, you could have wrong value, and you have a whole bunch of those data examples. Traditionally, in data management, we have these four dimensions of data quality, accuracy, completeness, timeliness, and consistency. And you can see there is actually a very interesting mapping between data quality and the model quality. If your data is not accurate enough, highly likely your model quality will actually suffer. If your data is not complete, in the sense you are missing certain population, it's entirely possible that your model will actually not be fair at all. So if you look at this mapping, uh, this is one experiment that we were running a couple of years ago. We actually take a whole bunch of dirty data set with a whole bunch of noise and try to run a whole bunch of machine learning models over them. So as you can see, if you try those different machine learning models, and first one, they do have different accuracy. And, but on the other hand, what's actually also interesting is all those models actually stop at this magic number, 76% iPhone score. So this is actually the best that your data can actually support, not the best that your model can actually learn. So if you just clean your data a little bit, right? if you have clean data side, right, you can actually easily add a couple points of improvement of them, like, like over it. So I think this is a statement that you have been hearing a lot during the last couple of days. It's often the best way to improve your machine learning model is to actually try to improve your data. But unfortunately, this is actually something that's very easy to say, but a little bit harder to do. Because when people are really trying to improve their data in their machine learning applications, there are a whole bunch of struggles they are facing today. The first struggle is there are so many things that you can do on your data. You can get more features, you can remove outliers, you can get more data examples, you can clean your data. So there's an overwhelming amount of possible operations that you also could do on the data side. And the second struggle is not all those operations are equally beneficial to the final utility. So often there's only a very small collection of operations that are really crucial, and many others are not that useful at all. The third struggle is actually after you fix something in your data set, the feedback loop is also very slow. Often you need to wait the machine learning training process to finish until you get your signal that whether your data operation actually help your model utility. And the, and the last struggle is that in real world, machine learning application is really simply about a machine learning training process. Often we are talking about a complex program that looks like this, where there's a only small components is actually about machine learning training and uh, the majority part of your application is actually about data transformation. If you put these four different struggles together, what we observe in practice is often our users are wasting their time and money trying to focus on data problems that often do not matter at all. But on the other hand, they are missing those really important data problems. So they need help. So the functionality that we want to enable look like this. Just imagine a world that wouldn't that be nice if every single Jupyter Notebook that you have have this magic button called debug. And once you click that, we will highlight every single operations inside that piece of code that is causing problems to the quality of the model, right? Our fairness, our robustness. 
And if you do not want to write code, wouldn't that be nice if every single AutoML platform have this magic button called improve data? And once you click that button, you select the objective, and uh, we bring you this order list of data examples that you should debug from the most important one to the least important one. So these are the things that we really want to enable for our user. Unfortunately, so there are very hard technical problems to tackle to actually make this happen. So this is the technical problem that we have been looking at. On one hand, you have your data set could contain a whole bunch of data problem. You pipe that into a feature extraction pipeline and machine learning model, and then you get your model, you can measure certain utility of this model. The thing that we want to understand is, can we trace back to the original data set to compute certain notion of importance for each data example? And how can we trace back to the feature extraction pipeline to compute the importance for every single feature extraction operator? So there are multiple questions that we need to tackle. The first one is how can we define those importance? It's actually very challenging because essentially we are compressing a very complex problem into a single dimensional number associated with the data example and also with the operator. The second question is how can we make that fast? How can we enable these real-time interactions between the user and also the system? And the third question is how can we use those to do something useful? So let's go through them quickly. So how can we define those importance? So this is actually not that easy. So imagine you have these four different data examples, right? So, and we say, yeah, what is the importance of the right tuple? And what can we do? Well, one simple thing that you can do is can just say, yeah, let's remove this right tuple, right? So in this case, you can compare the difference of accuracy adding this red tuple or without this red tuple, you can already get some improvement. So this can already tell you something about the importance of red tuple. But on the other hand, it could also be suboptimal. And it's actually very easy for you to find an example that why it is suboptimal. So just imagine you have this four different data examples, two are bad and two are good, and your utility is formed in a way that as long as you have one bad example in the data set, your accuracy is going to suffer. Only if you have only good examples, your accuracy is good. If you compute this leave one out notion of importance for the right tuple, yeah, I mean, you'll get zero. If you compute the leave one out notion of this uh, yellow tuple, you will also have zero. So as you can see, leave one out type of importance can be confusing, especially when there are strong correlations between those examples, which is actually often the case in practice. So what can we do? So once you can do is actually by considering all the different combinations of other tuples. And then you can aggregate those improvement and use that as your importance. You can aggregate them in different ways. You can simply compute the average, right, which have a close relationship with multilinear extension. It actually works well in many cases. You can also weight them in a certain specific way then you get something called the Shapley value. It has a very sound game theoretical foundation, many good properties, and people have been showing that it works well in many cases. So there's actually a very interesting trade-off between these different ways to to weight all those improvements. But in practice, they are often performed better than the one out notion of things. So I'm not going to detail about the trade-off, but essentially, uh, in many cases, this uniform weighting and Sharpie value could outperform the even out pretty significantly. And in many applications, there's also this trade-off between Sharpie value and this uniform weighting. But once you define those importance, the second question is actually how can we compute those? Because if you look at Sharpie value or uniform weighting, there are multiple challenges associated with those. The first one is actually, yeah, so you need to enumerate a whole bunch of possible world, right, which could be exponentially hard. And also for other notion of importance, for example, entropy or expected improvement, you have the same problem. So we have to do something here. The second challenge is that in practice, a machine learning application, yeah, rarely look like this. Often they look like something like this. There's a small components about machine learning training, but there's an even larger components about the feature extraction. 
So if you look at the two challenges together, we are actually lacking the fundamental understanding about how to connect these two different areas. On one hand, there's a data management community try to understand data transformation and computing some functions over exponentially uh, many public databases for decades. On the other hand, there's a machine learning community try to understand data importance for machine learning training over the last at least one decade. Oh, ac yeah, actually even more, like for decades. We kind of need to bring them together. So this is what we know. One thing that we know is that if you look at this end to the machine learning pipeline, it's actually super hard to, to analyze that. But on the other hand, you actually approximate them, uh, approximate them in a certain way, and then you have this proxy pipeline for your original pipeline. And that can actually make your problem much, much easier. Essentially, given this like an like like end-to-end program, the thing you can do is to approximate your feature extraction pipeline as it opponents. Right? Theoretically, you can just represent those as some polynomials in the polynomial semi-ring. They have different shape of the pipelines. And you can approximate your machine learning training components into some simpler classifier, for example, a Kenyan's neighbor classifier. So once you do this, you can, act, you can actually have polynomial time algorithm for a whole bunch of important metrics, such as Sharpie value, expected prediction, or entropy. And the improvement can be pretty dramatic. So here we have a system called Datascope, right? So this is just one data set. So as you can see, comparing with putting those values using MCMC, right? You have this four order to five orders of magnitude speed up compared with like, like those approaches. And it, it actually works. So this is just one example where you have some wrong labels in your training site. You train your end-to-end -end machine learning pipeline. And then if you follow the Sharpie value computed on each of these data example, you can have this data debugging mechanism that actually improve your uh, accuracy of these machine learning applications much, much faster than, than this random strategy. And then you can plug in different type of objectives. So here's one application where you have a data set that a 100% clean data set has some fairness issue. Meaning that if you clean up the whole data set, the model could be unfair. In this case, you can also use fairness as objective for data debugging, right? So in this case, if you look at this improvement of accuracy, right? So as you can see, right, if you have this fairness objective for, 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 for the Sharpie value thing, you can actually still improve your accuracy. But on the other hand, if you measure the fairness of the trained machine learning model, you can see if you do this clean in a random way, you could become more and more unfair. But on the other hand, if you have fairness as an objective, you can have a cleaning like, a, like strategy that bring up your accuracy by at least 20 points, but on the other hand, essentially keep the same level of fairness. So this is something that you can play with, right? So we have these two open source repo. It's very easy to use. You can just plug in your secular pipeline, right? And then you input your utility, and then with a single lens of code, you can actually compute the Sharpie value for each of those data uh, examples. So another thing that uh, could be interesting for everyone to look at is this data probe challenge. Uh, we contribute to one of those challenge about data debugging, right? So it's going to compute figures like this, right? To really try to compare different type of data debugging method. So please play with it and give us feedback. Yeah, so thanks a lot for your attention. I'm now happy to answer whatever question you guys may have. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. It was, it was such an incredible talk, and you laid out uh, your presentation very clearly. I, I'm really appreciative of your talk. Um, uh, for the questions, uh, so Braden has one question for you, and he says, uh, the value of cleaning uh, of data cleaning seems pretty clear from this presentation, but techniques vary pretty widely in complexity. Example, drop exact duplicates versus analysis that require a trained model embeddings, et cetera. From your experience with clean ML, what data cleaning techniques would you recommend? First, from a return on investment standpoint. Yeah, so I mean, that's a, a actually a very interesting question. So I guess there are two different dimensions, right? So there's the mechanism of cleaning things up, like duplicates or like, like a missing value or wrong value, right? Usually you have a one data set that contains all those problems, right? So we do not actually have a strong opinion 
on what is the best mechanism for you to clean up your data because it is our belief that's going to be closely related to your application. For some application, maybe duplicate matters more. For some application, maybe missing value matters more. It also depends on your final utility, whether you care about accuracy or fairness. They will give you different importance for different mechanisms. So what we are actually interested in is actually given those oceans or potential operations that you could do, how can we give user a guidance about which is the potentially important thing? That is actually what we have been looking at. Right, so I would say uh, I actually don't know uh, what mechanism is going to perform better for any application, but there is a systematic way for you to compute which is more important for the user. Yeah, I see that makes sense. So your technique would uh, enable the user to make their own decisions on to what is important and what to focus on next. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So so I think the whole thing will be highly related to application. So I think that's also what we found out. Yeah. Yeah. So the problem of working at home is sometimes ruin the file of the door. Sorry for the noise. Yeah. Oh no worries at all. <laughs> that's totally all right. Um Bridget has a follow-up question uh, and he says, it makes sense that what technique you use will be very much task dependent. What are the major categories of techniques or types of data dirtiness in your mind? Hmm. So, I mean, that's a good question. So I guess there's outlier, there's uh, duplicates, there's missing value, there's uh, distributional drift, right? You mm -hmm. have a, like a different type of like, uh, like sample probability for different subpopulation. Uh, mm -hmm. So those are things that we have been looking at, uh, at least in the clean ML benchmark. So I'm sure there are more. Right, so it's kind of interesting for the whole community to come together and try to have a complete list of the data problems. But so far, these are the things that we have been focusing on. Yeah, got it. Uh, makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Um, next question is from Kia, and they ask: Is there a research paper that details out your approach or methodology? Oh yeah, 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 exactly. So, so I think the best reference. Uh, the pro so like over the years we have been doing a whole bunch of things. Uh, but I think the best reference or the latest one would be this paper, right? So we have one paper about pretty much the computational complexity of computing sharply by those uh, over different type of end-to-end -end pipelines. Uh, so this would be the paper uh, I would read first, yeah. <laughs> if you're interested in what we do, yeah. Perfect. Um, we have another question from Roshni and uh, she says, have you thought about how to improve the timeliness problem? How can we iterate on feedback from the data debugging faster? Yeah, so I mean, that's actually a very interesting question. So there are two different angles to that. So the first one is the consequence. Uh, so, so, so the consequence of focusing on timeliness is you need to have this data debugging loop run multiple times, right? So our hope is by making this importance computation thing run very fast. The user can have this real-time debugging experience in the sense that every single time they fix some data problem, they get some feedback in like a couple seconds, right? To make sure they are very comfortable in the loop. So that is something that with this like a uh, Kenyan's neighbor proxy thing, uh, to some extent we are able to achieve. But there's another dimension of timeliness, which is Whenever you are using your data example multiple times, you start to have the problem of overfitting in the sense that your data doesn't really reflect reality that much or, 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 or start to cause problems, right? So there we actually have another paper about how to quantify uh, essentially the staleness of your data and try to bond the difference between uh, what you can get on an older version of data and what you can get with the latest version of data. We don't know how to put them together. It's definitely very interesting to actually try to think about how to put them together. But right now, we have these two different lines of thought, I would say, yeah. about timeliness. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Uh, thanks for sharing that. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, Roshni has a follow-up question. And she says, how can you validate the accuracy of the importance calculation? Yeah, that's a good question. So I don't know. <laughs> yeah, the short answer is I don't know. How can we evaluate that? 
So there are two different ways to think about it. Uh, one way is to measure the effectiveness of important computation by its utility, right? A good importance will be useful, right? So the way to, uh, to do that is really by trying to understand, yeah, if you have this importance, can you use it to enable something interesting, right? So here mm -hmm. you have two different notions of importance. One is a random importance, right? Another is this sharply value thing, right? So given some task, right, you can actually measure, yeah, we try and perform better, right? So that's one way for you to measure what is a good importance. But we are not happy about it, right? So because that, that kind of relies on your underlying task. So one thing that we have been looking at at this moment is really try to understand how can we define what is the optimal importance that you could have. And the current thinking that we have at this moment is by defining this using the framework of, of intervention, right? How can we define the optimal importance which will lead to auto, uh, like optimal intervention of a data example and try to compute the difference between your importance and this optimal importance. So we have some thinking here, but we don't have anything published, but I definitely agree with you. How can we evaluate those so many different ways for the compute importance? It's definitely a very, very important problem. So we hope we will have something for you in six months. Yeah. That's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing, sir. It was uh, amazing to have you here. Uh, we learned so much about your work. And thank you so much for answering the questions. Thank um, you. Yeah.